Good evening and welcome to the first program in the Fort Hall Forum's 88th consecutive year and the beginning of a stimulating and exciting fall series of lectures. My name is Bill McNally. I'm a lawyer in town here with Bingham, Daner and Gould. And I'm also the president of the Fort Hall Forum. And it's in this latter connection that I'll be your moderator this evening. Talk of a possible third party in American politics is very much the news every day. Dissatisfaction with both Democrats and Republicans seems to be at an all-time high, fueling speculations that candidacies by Colin Powell, Ross Perot, or Bill Bradley, or many others might actually be viable. Joining us this evening are two, fam two people intimately familiar with this increasingly popular middle ground in politics. In fact, in many ways, they have created it. Former U.S. Senator Paul Songus won the New Hampshire primary in his run for the Democratic presidential nomination in 1992, and the respect of much of this nation with his combination of fiscal conservatism and social liberalism. He founded, along with Senator, former Senator Warren Rudman of New Hampshire and former Treasury Secretary Pete Peterson, too many formers in this uh, group, but the Concord Coalition, a group dedicated to deficit reduction. Paul is currently a partner here in Boston in the law firm of Foley, Hoag, and Elliott. Former Connecticut Governor Lowell Weicker has often been mentioned as a possible contender for an independent run at the presidency. As the first independent to actually win and serve as a governor of his state in this century, Mr. Weicker has earned a reputation as a political maverick willing to make unpopular decisions when necessary. Indeed, some of his detractors would say that he's willing to make unpopular decisions when they're not necessary. <laughs> As governor, he implemented the first state income tax in Connecticut's history to rein in the state's growing uh, debt. He also imposed tough handgun controls and introduced progressive legislation on health reform, which is perhaps a national model. Currently, the former governor is serving as chairman of the 1995 International Special Olympics. Both men are particular heroes of mine for the independence of judgment and the courage of their convictions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Paul Songus and Lowell Weicker. Now, I understand why I'm supposed to adjust one of these microphones, right? So. Um, what I'm going to try to do here, very simply, is to suggest where I think the American public is politically, and then see where that leads anybody to the question of a third party or an independent candidacy. We have seen the, um, all the attention given to Ross Perot's third party, um, the potential candidacy of a, uh, of a Colin Powell. And we can get to that um, in due course and doing the Q&A. But what I would like to do is to suggest, as someone who spends his life um, accumulating frequent flyer miles um, and speaking around the country where I think uh, our fellow Americans are, 
politically, philosophically, and then see whether either of the two major parties is consistent with that view. I would contend that most Americans fit certain prototype. And I don't mean everybody. One thing about a democracy, you don't need everybody. You need 50% plus one to agree with you. And you're the mayor or the, you're the president or whatever you might be. What I'm suggesting is that there's a majority of Americans who fit a certain prototype, a certain paradigm, and that paradigm is in the middle of the spectrum. It is what I would refer to as the passionate center. You know, center in American politics has always been referred to as the place where you find disinterested um, people and dead armadillos. Well, in this case, the center in American politics, I would submit, has passion. And let me suggest what, what those four characteristics are. One, socially inclusive. Most Americans, particularly younger Americans, have come to understand that we are a multicultural society. Whether you like it or not, that's what we are. And the sooner we learn to accept that and to uh, bring it about, the better off we're all going to be. And part of the rationale is very simple. We are out there trying to compete in the international marketplace. It's a very Darwinian world that we are now in. And we need everybody to perform to the best of their abilities. And to the extent you cut people down on the basis of anything, you have a lesser society. And for example, if you think of it as countries uh, in a crew race, very apropos metaphor for Cambridge and Boston. And, and we're racing against the Japans and the Taiwans and the Germanys, countries that are basically monocultural. Everybody's sitting there rowing earnestly. And in America, our crew, which is multicultural, they're all standing up in the boat with their oars crashing each other over the head in dispute and wondering, why aren't we moving? Well, if you're going to compete in this world in a very harsh economic climate, you have to have a nation that's in sync. And the week after the OJ trauma, I think we have renewed reason to want to heal and to face starkly the divisions um, in this nation. But multiculturalism is going to be. And most Americans, as I said, particularly the young, understand that. And whether you talk about women's issues, for example, most w Republican women are pro-choice, or whatever issue you wish to raise, I think that's the instinct in the majority of American hearts. Secondly, fiscally conservative. Americans want to balance the budget, because they balance the budget at home. Where they work, they have to balance the budget. The cities and states have to balance the budget. And they have a very strong sense that what has happened in Washington is not only hired economics, it is generationally immoral. The accumulation of debt is not just a matter of what happens to your capacity to invest in kidnapping the national savings. It is fundamentally a violation by one generation against the generation it has produced. Jimmy Carter to George Washington, or to be more historically correct in this building, George Washington to Jimmy Carter, trillion dollars of debt, a little less. Ronald Reagan, his first term, doubled that, added another trillion. Did so in his second term. Bush did so in his first term. And Bill Clinton has done so in his first term. There's no way that you can justify whatever one might feel about tax and spend policies that the transition to spend and borrow has any moral foundation. 
You can make the argument on an economic ground, but I think the passion for fiscal responsibility is generational. Strongest bond in human ages between the parent and the child and massive debt left for the next generation violates that responsibility. And most members of the Concord Coalition are either young people who understand, hey, we're being left with this debt and the American dream will be denied to many of us. And parents and grandparents who feel a guilt, an angst, a concern about what they've done. So that's the second side of it. Third, these two will go more quickly. Most Americans are environmentalists, pro-environment, particularly the young. You talk to young people today in clean water and clean air and protection of uh, resources is a given. It's not a matter of dispute. Among older people who grew up in a different age, it may be of some um, discussion, but among the young, there is the presumption that the earth is sacred and it must be protected. And I would suggest the Republicans make a huge mistake when they begin to wander into this area and talk about lessening standards of environmental protection. Witness the reaction to the proposal to start drilling in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge. We're a long way from there, but we know that's not right. That there has to be at some point a sense of sacredness for what uh, the Earth is about. And the final point is pro-campaign reform that there is a revulsion in this country about the role of money in politics. Um, I remember during the presidential campaign, um, I and uh, Bill Clinton were the candidates who took a no PAC money pledge. And we felt very good about that. And one particularly uh, resourceful reporter uh, challenged me at a press conference and said, Senator, I've looked up your background, and when you ran for the Senate in 1978, you took PAC money, didn't you? I said, well, yes, I did. Then she said, don't you feel like a hypocrite? I said, but I took very little. She said, why did you take very little? I said, I was offered very little. The access that politicians, and the reason I was offered very little was because I was the challenger. And the monies available then were peanuts compared to what's available now. So when the Democratic National Committee says, if you contribute $100,000, you'll have dinner with President Clinton, the country is repulsed. And the money that Newt Gingrich and Dick Gephardt are raising for their go pack funds and all of that, same thing. Because people instinctively know that when these PAC committees contribute, they're not doing it because they're set up as a philanthropic institution. They think they're buying something. So getting rid of PACs, um, cutting down the franking privilege, all of that. So that's the paradigm. Socially liberal, fiscally conservative, pro-environment, pro-campaign reform. And you go through that, those four, any place in this country, you may get some disagreement, but you don't get a violent reaction. That's ridiculous. So the question then is, does the Democratic Party, does the Republican Party give you those four? Do they fit, fill the vacuum in the center? The answer is no. On the social side, the Republican Party is the party of the Willie Horton ad. The Willie Horton ad was not an accident. The Willie Horton ad was a specific, calculated attempt to divide by race. It was as cynical as it gets, and it will always be a blemish on George Bush, who otherwise, most people would agree, was a very decent human being. 
You just watch that ad and try to understand the people who did it, and it speaks volumes. Democrats, quite good on that, social side. All those people, with one exception, up in New Hampshire yesterday were anti-choice, even though most Republican women are pro-choice. On the fiscal side, give Republicans credit for their courage. I disagree with the tax cut vehemently, so does Warren Rudman, Pete Peterson, but at least they're trying to balance the budget. Democrats couldn't balance the budget if their lives depended on it. Democrats believe that our role is to redistribute wealth, not recognizing you have to create it first. There was a disconnect, and then everybody knows it. And what the Democrats are doing in Washington today, using class warfare and scaring seniors, is equally reprehensible, in my mind, to the Willie Horton Act. The environment, Democrats have a wonderful history. And traditionally, the environmentalists were Republicans. The Lowell Weikers, the Brad Morses, people like that. But the Republican right, if you've seen one red wood, you've seen them all, is not environmentalism. It is a short-term disregard for the environment. And on political reform, Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich and Claremont shook hands on political reform and then proceeded to forget it. Why? Because nobody down there in Washington wants reform, because they benefit from the system. So you have this alienation when you go through these four from the American people and the majority of the American people. So all of the discussion about a third party or an independent candidacy comes from this vacuum. And like anything else in life, when there's a market, there'll be a product. As long as the market is there, somebody will come along and provide the product. What I'm trying to do is to get the Democrats to move into that vacuum. What Lowell's trying to do, I suspect, is to get the Republicans to move into that vacuum. But neither one of them is going to, in my judgment. So the interest is going to be, what is the third way? Is it going to be a person, a candidate, third party, whatever? And 1996 is going to be fascinating as we watch this uh, evolve. Um, I think there are a lot of interesting perspectives about Colin Powell, what uh, Ross Perot is doing, those kinds of things, but I'll leave that to your questions and turn it over to the one person who's actually served a full term as an independent and lived to tell the tale. So, cool. Thank you very much, Paul, Bill, and all those attending the Ford Hall Forum. I know you're not feeling too good about the baseball wars around this town, <clears throat> but I want to tell you something that might, I don't know how many share this heritage with me, but as a young, as a youngster in New York, five years of age, I started a habit which I've continued throughout my life, including my standing up here before all of you. First baseball game I ever was taken to was at the Polo Grounds in New York. And the New York Giants were playing the Boston Bees. Now, how many of you are old enough to remember that there was a team called the Boston Bees, managed by Casey Stengel? Everybody in my family and all of our friends, obviously coming from New York, rooting for the New York Giants. And as I say, I started a habit which I've stayed with. I decided this was my first baseball game, it was the first team I ever saw, I was going to root for the Boston Bees. And I have followed them from the Boston Bees to the Boston Braves to the Milwaukee Braves to the Atlanta Braves, so I'm feeling pretty good tonight <laughs> in terms of uh, where we sit. But believe me, I too, as a National League Boston fan, have gone through many, many lean years. I love 
this town, and I love your teams, and I love all of you. I think it's just really one of the greatest places in our, in our, in our country. And Paul Songus, who brought such integrity to the United States Senate, and also to his efforts in public, whether it was the presidential campaign, whether it was the Concord Coalition, he, he represents exactly what best defines the, the word leadership. Now, what I'd like to do this evening is to depart somewhat from some of the comments that I've made in the past, although I'm going to just very briefly run over the comments as it relates to an independent or a third party, because I think it's important to get up to speed on this. And then I want to shift into a, another question that deals with independence, which has yet to be asked of the American people. But of course, it's my proposition that it's the politics in the United States today that is strangling the governing. Candidates, by the time they get through with their campaign, are neutered as office holders. By the time everybody's taken pledges and said what it is they're going to do or not do, they're incapable then of meeting the challenges, opportunity, problems that confront them when an office holder. We have moved from the politics of accountability to the politics of electability. And when the electors are down to 36 percent, as was the case in the last election, that spells big trouble for this country, as the country is then governed by one-issue candidates or those that have a very narrow vision as to our nation. And the politics is of such a nature that, confronted with any great opportunity or problem, both parties, both established parties, take soft landings on those problems or opportunities, because that's the smart thing to do politically. Well, reality does not succumb to philosophy or partisanship. Reality succumbs to reality. And if we have problems today, it is that we have not confronted them. And in a few minutes, I'm going to get to that, to that point. And indeed, the two parties arrange to make sure that whatever it is they do governmentally it will not in any way hinder or impinge on their re-election efforts. This all came to classic fact in the income tax debate in Connecticut. When I arrived, by the time I raised my hand as governor of the state, the state had a $1 billion deficit on a $7 billion budget. This is the wealthiest state in the nation, per capita income-wise. Remind you of something else, the wealthiest nation in the world, with one of the largest deficits in the world, probably the largest percentage-wise. In any event, I walked into that office not as one who was for an income tax philosophically, indeed against it, but I allowed the facts to dictate the response not only as to eliminating the deficit, but to make sure that the state would not once again, having cured the deficit, roll back into it. And there was only one answer. There are many philosophical answers, and there would have been good partisan answers, but only one factual answer. Now, here's the interesting story, because it goes on day after day down in Washington. During the course of the debate, after I presented my budget, which was honestly balanced, no gimmicks, everybody had to share in the pain, and the result was going to be there. And indeed, as it proved out, the result was there, as we then reported four straight surpluses. Conservative Democrats got together with the Republicans 
and presented three alternative budgets, all of which were patently out of balance. And they agreed among themselves that anybody that would vote for that budget would not be contested by the other party at election time. Now that is what actually happened as a matter of fact, yet that goes on de facto down in Washington on tough issues all the time. And it's why we now have to live with those issues today. Change, which has always has been our stock and trade as a nation, we're now afraid of it. And yet, unless we change our politics, the world is going to eat, the world is going to eat our lunch governmentally. The world has no interest in our philosophies, conservative, liberal, or our partisanship, Republican, Democrat. And the world is now competing head to head with the United States of America. And we'd best understand that. And whereas we have maybe been able to fool ourselves, the world is not going to be a party to that kind of a charade. Now, I ask you a very simple question as to the reason for having a, a third party or a third candidacy. Why would the monopoly of politics, which, or duopoly, why would the monopoly of politics render results different from monopoly in economics? Why do you think our profession is exempt from what happens in economics? What happens in economics? High prices, bad products. What happens in politics? Bad candidates, bad ideas. We can't be exempt from the rules of monopoly or the ills of monopoly. And that's why I say that after we get through what, nibbling around the edges, changing the Constitution, term limits, different kinds of laws passed to encourage voting, etc. Listen, do it the way we do everything else in this country. Competition. Competition. That's what we speak for, Paul and I and others, who understand how this bad politics is now dominating our activities as a nation. That's the reason for a third party or candidate, to bring that competition and get the best of the ideas and the best of people, and to encourage the same out of the incumbent two parties. But tonight, I'd like to lay something else before you. Because Paul's right. Everybody says fine to an independent party, at least when they're polled. And I'm very heartened by that. Paul is also. But the other day, I was thinking about this, and I said to myself, well, maybe you ought to ask the next tough question. I mean, how do I know that you're saying you're for a third party isn't another effort by the American people to buy time, just like a constitutional, balance the budget constitutional amendment? That, to me, is, that's, that's, that's buying time instead of, you know, balancing the budget. Or in terms of getting good people in government term limits instead of getting your, you know what, down to the voting booth and voting the bad ones out and the good ones in. Buying time. How do I know this independent party idea, which I've worked for for a long time, isn't buying time? The real question, I think, then, that I'd like to ask tonight is the, are the American people ready for an independent message? A message independent of the GOP and the, and the Democrats in terms of its candor and its realism, because quite frankly, a third party without an independent message is nothing. A new politics of candor and realism, not measured by polls or referendums, but by the quality of leadership. Not, not tell me what you want, but rather, here it is, the truth. 
If you don't want it, don't elect me. But let's say this up front, okay? And if I can't deliver it, kick me out. No more the elected whose only difference from the electors is that they have money and a place on the ballot. That's not leadership. That's not leadership. For example, so we've got Paul here, and he's been delivering the message on the matter of the budget and balancing it. Let's ask the question. I don't like to raise taxes. I don't like cutting programs that ostensibly do good for a lot of people or cutting back on entitlements. I don't like any one or, or all of those. But tell me, everybody, how do you balance the budget? Unless it's just talk, how do you do it? It's up to you to stand up there and say, along with a leader who stands up there and says, what needs to be done, like it or not? We've all read in the last 48 hours the report of the Carnegie Foundation as to where our children are in the United States. In the most primitive societies in the world, children rank at the top of the list, not in the United States. And this is not some bleeding heart liberal or moderate Republican trying to persuade you with my philosophy. Those are the facts as given to you by the Carnegie Foundation as to the condition of children in the United States for the first time in the history of the United States this generation, the generation of children born today, will be worse off economically, educationally, health-wise than the previous generation. First time in our history. That's a statistic. That's a statistic. That's not me trying to persuade you. Well, what are you going to do about that statistic? What is a leader going to say as to once again allocating the resources of this nation and the laws of this nation so that children are number one? that once again we become a nation that lives for our children. Never mind getting the tears in the eyes, you know, one day a year, either at the school or at the Special Olympics or wherever. How about, you know, 365 days allocating the resources? I illustrate that best in the area of health care. 90% of the $900 billion going to the last 40 weeks of life? What do you think that means to the children and the young adults of this nation? Certainly, I believe, and, and I've got plenty of the gray hair, or very little bit less either way, but, but the fact is, yeah, I'd like to spend a few comfortable years at the end, but not in those proportions. Not for all the suffering and the lack of a future that entails for our children. When I was in the United States Senate, I never took much of a role in addressing the matter of handguns. A lot of other things I was doing, I never got involved in that debate. But tell me something. Tell me something. What do you plan to do and what does a leader expect to say about the statistic, not my philosophy of 16,000 Americans killed by handguns a year? What do you say to that statistic? What are you going to do about it? What if I told you 16,000 people just died in Boston from some virus? Believe me, you'd be hopping all over the government one way or the other to do something about it. What are we doing about that? You mean because it's somebody else that got shot and you really didn't know them? And yet isn't that the statistic of violence in our society? The Constitution of the United States, just to make you feel good, we're going to go ahead and make sure that even though it built this nation, mind you, we were always few in numbers in the United States, but the ideals enunciated in that document gave us a strength way beyond our numbers. And it brought us to this position of power in the world, enjoying unparalleled religious freedom and peace. And yet you're going to let somebody go ahead and say, oh, that separation of church and state didn't mean anything. Really? Not in terms of the history? And all you have to do is look out the window at Bosnia or Northern Ireland or the Middle East? I'm not proud of my nation for that separation of church and state. You bet your darn right I am. 
or the fact that, as I said before, oh, we're, we're going to write some words on a paper saying balance, balance the budget in the Constitution. Do you realize the state that I took over at $1 billion on a $7 billion budget had a law saying you couldn't have an unbalanced budget? Well, how the hell did we get it to that position? The answer is very simple on balancing the budget. Balance it. I used to say during Ronald Reagan's time down there, I know some Republicans got a little bit irritated, but to me, Reagan used to send us constantly unbalanced budgets and then call for a balance the budget constitutional amendment. And I said, well, that'd be, like going, that'd be like going to BC or BU or Harvard during the football game and seeing the quarterback run off the field into the stand saying, we want a touchdown. <clears throat> balance it. And the isolation of race in this country, as you know, after I I'm always looking for something to do, and after I got through with an income tax, I introduced the, the legislation to go ahead and eliminate the racial isolation in our schools in Connecticut. So I'm not pointing at you, but I'm pointing at us. 83% of the minorities in 40 out of the 170 school districts in the state. That's the United States? I don't think so. Or, or as we try to put in to specific areas, mainly our cities, this great diverse element of the United States. What, what are we doing here? How does this relate to our history or what brought us to greatness as a diverse society? And people better say this. These are the messages, all of them unpopular, every one of them. No, I don't like being different, to be very honest. I don't like spending 20 years in the United States Senate and becoming one of the most senior of the senators but never recognized by my own party because I wouldn't go along. But maybe that's the whole problem now with the United States. We've gone along, we've gone along, we've gone along, and it was all right as long as we were the only kid on the block, but we're no longer the only kid on the block. We've got some bona fide contenders out there, and as I said before, they're coming after us. This time it isn't with arms, but it sure is with economics and every other type of weapon you can conceive of. So that's the question I ask here this evening. Are you ready for the independent message? if it's a real independent message, not a variation of Republicans or Democrats, but some very tough news that, that we all, as the people of the United States, have to decide upon. And that brings me to the last point. No letting all of you, representing the people of the United States, and now me also, we're in the highest positions of power, not senators and governors. We the people. We're not, I'm not letting anybody off the hook, okay? What the United States wants, the United States will get. If it chooses to leave the field and not give the tough answers to the tough problems, then that's reflected in Washington and Hartford or wherever. It's not Clinton, it's not Dole, it's not Gingrich, it's us. I don't know how many of you saw that wonderful movie on public television, Simple Justice, the story of Thurgood Marshall and Brown versus the Board of Education. But Thurgood Marshall and Charlie Houston went down to South Carolina before World War II to visit the schools down there for the black children. And they had a big meeting pulled together by one of the local ministers and everybody walked out of the meeting, all the blacks saying, hey, it's all right for you, Mr. Marshall and, and Mr. Houston, you're going back to the NAACP in New York, we gotta live down here. So we don't want any trouble. And then World War II occurred, and right after World War II, they were asked to come back down because of a bad decision that had been rendered in a South Carolina court. Again, there was a meeting of all the parents, and every one of them stood up there and said, we want to stand up as a class action on behalf of our children getting an equal education. And of course, Clarendon County was packaged with Virginia and with Topeka in what became Brown versus the Board of Education and what changed quality of education in this country forever. So we, as a people, are the ones that will set the agenda if we choose to do so, and if we choose to accept the toughness of the answers that have to be given at this time in our nation's history. And I suppose my advice to all of you is the same advice, again, from the same movie, Simple Justice, when Thurgood Marshall was making his final argument before the Supreme Court of the United States. And he hadn't done very well in articulating a quality of educational opportunity the day before, so he really he needed a home run 
to bring forth the point. And he turned to the Supreme Court and he said, surely you cannot, as judges, close your eyes to what you know to be true as men. And that really is the challenge for all of us. We know, we know the truth of our own country. And it's up to us to insist that that truth be our governings. Thank you very much. I must say that the quality of those remarks and the method of their delivery have a particular resonance in this room and their challenge to us as Americans to reflect on whether the third party and independent movement is the latest form of avoidance behavior or really represents a fundamental change. Uh, now is the time that our guests will take your questions. It's one of the particular strengths of the Ford Hall Forum that it insists on a two-way dialogue between its audience and its speakers at each and every one of its programs. If you have a question, please come to the microphone at the front of the center aisle here, the middle of the center aisle. And because we're recording this program for later broadcast also, would you please speak slowly and clearly without touching the microphone so that we can get as many questions as possible. Also, please keep your remarks succinct so the speakers have an opportunity to respond to your question instead of listening to your speech. Uh, we might begin, sir. Uh, I think we need some good new leadership like we've been talking about. And I want to ask Mr. Weicker, uh, how, we, how do we implement this? What is the good of having a third party or something if they're only going to lose the election? I have to confess, in most groups, I always figured I'm the most liberal person here, and I voted for more third world third uh, <laughs> uh, parties uh, starting back in uh, 1940 and the first and usually they lost and the first president I ever voted for was Jack Kennedy and then they shot him but uh, I, I want to see uh, if we have a third party I'd like it not to just go down the drain it needs to really win and be a strong party I know uh, I was in the Peace Corps fairly recently like my friend, and uh, people in Africa would tell me, how come Jimmy Carter isn't president? He's a good man, and he is. Well, I think it's going to happen if you believe it will happen. I mean, I, st I, I sit here before you having been elected as an independent, having governed as an independent. Angus King is governing right now in Maine as an independent. Walter Hickel governing Alaska as an independent. Bernie Sanders, uh, who's a representative, but he might as well, again, he's, he's one person from a, an entire state. These things can happen. Now the problem comes, I'll tell you where the problem comes. It's come election day, the greatest threat, I think, to an independent candidacy is, is 24 hours before the election where people say, well, I don't want to throw away my vote. I mean, I saw this happen in Connecticut where my lieutenant governor, Eunice Grork, was the independent candidate against the Republican and Democrats to succeed me. Every single poll where the public analyzed the candidate said she had the most integrity, the best qualified to be governor, right on down the list. And yet everybody I'd run into, well, I'm not afraid, I don't want to throw away my vote. I don't, I, I don't want so-and-so, the Democrat or so-and-so, the Republican to get in. I said, well, my God, don't you want the best person? I mean, that is the issue. And you won't throw your vote away if you get the best person. Now, if the independents, you know, nominate some nerd, there's no reason why you should vote for that, just because he or she is an independent. But the answer is that, that yes, it can work. And I think you want an honest broker at that table. And believe me, if you're a Republican or a Democrat, it'll actually improve your party and your candidates also. It did in Connecticut. But that element of competition is needed to break the monopoly. And you've got to believe that you can do it 
in terms of electing that individual. I wonder, uh, Lowell, before we came over here tonight, you were talking about the distinction between a third party and an independent candidate. I wonder if you might elaborate on, well, on that. Well, Paul alluded to this also. Uh, it would be very difficult to go ahead and establish a third party in time for the 96 election. Even Perot is going to have trouble with that. But, but because the rules that follow on, in other words, to become eligible as a third party in a state, and then that requires that third party to set up a whole group of rules as to how they elect delegates, et cetera. There's just not the time for it. So if, if for 96 this happens, it'll happen in terms of an independent candidacy. And I would suspect if Perot runs, there could still very well be an independent candidacy that satisfies intellectually this great big center. So in other words, you could have actually a fourth candidate. If Perot does not run, then I think there's a very good chance you'll have that third candidate contest whoever the Republicans and Democrats bring up. Next question. For the past uh, 20 years, I'd say, the Libertarian Party has been on the ballot in all 50 states and running candidates on a more or less uh, uh, socially tolerant, fiscally conservative platform. And yet it really hasn't made a whole lot of headway, and it's pretty much ignored by the media. I'm wondering why you think that is, and I'm curious what you think in general of the, of the Libertarian Party. Well, I think it probably comes to pass by virtue of, of, of two things. First of all, obviously you do need some name recognition vis-a-vis -vis your candidates. And most of the time, I have not seen a libertarian, I'm only speaking from Connecticut now, run who was really widely known in the state. But then the most important aspect of this is that neither have I seen the Libertarian Party cover a broad spectrum of issues. In other words, yes, you have a, almost a personal philosophy toward government. That doesn't mean you can stand up at election time and not address the issues of major concern uh, to the constituents. And that's, I think, that's why, I mean, we all know when I keep on talking third party or fourth party, we've had lots of parties out there, but they invariably have been too narrow in their focus. I think that probably holds true with the libertarians, who, are, quite frankly, I think have a lot of very good ideas, and you say responsible in many ways. I, have, I don't have any negative thoughts at all. But I think in terms of being perceived as addressing the broad spectrum of issues, I think that's where it falls apart. Paul, any comment on that? It was interesting, though. I think the the problem is the Libertarian Party does not think of itself as a contender for power. The impression you get, it's more of a statement. I think it has to cross that divide. But a lot of what you hear today does sound very similar, doesn't it, to what the Libertarians have been talking about. My, my problem with the party is that a government has to be a player. And the sort of do-your-own-thing approach um, gives me some concern. I think most people feel that way. Next question. Um, a hypothetical. Let's assume that we do in some, some year not terribly distant have a person elected president who is running neither as a Democrat or Republican. And let's say that I'm a latter-day Rip Van Winkle who just woke up and someone said, this just happened. I was wondering if each of you could explain what happened. Who got elected? If you know a person or if you don't know who it would be, how? Did they run as an independent? Did they run once and lose? Did they run as a third party? Describe the scenario that's going to, that you think is each most likely for having a non-member non of the first two parties, of these current two parties. So tell us, Lowell, when Rip asks you, how did you get there, what will you say? <laughs> I had a very difficult decision to make as to how I was going to run. And indeed, all of my advisors suggested that I run in the Republican Party. And I said, I can't. I just, there's just too much disagreement between the Republican Party and myself. The Democrats have been in power in Connecticut. They obviously haven't got the job done. So I'm going to get right to the heart of the matter and just go out there and run in the general election. Now, fortunately, and I will admit this, I had name recognition, so I could go ahead and do that, having been the United States Senator for 18 years in Congress, too. So I was known. 
But I felt, why waste my money on a bunch of Republicans who, in effect, kicked me out of office in the 88 election, and with whom I disagree so sharply on a variety of issues? And certainly, I've got no desire to be a Democrat. They've dr driven the state into bankruptcy here. So I just went out and did my thing. And were it not for a particular media phenomenon, but we didn't have enough money to cover Fairfield County because all the advertising for Fairfield County comes out of New York and it's too expensive. Had it not been for that, would have been elected overwhelmingly. I was elected by, I won by a couple of points, but that would have been much bigger had it not been for that situation. The governing part is really interesting. Now, mind you, I came in again to the job with experience. But all of a sudden, instead of instead of partisanship being the common denominator for either being for or against something, you have to turn to the people of both parties. And all of a sudden, courage and vision and uh, you know, smarts, all the rest of it comes into play as being the new common denominator, the things you'd expect should govern our legislation. And you put together coalitions to pass it. We hit every single hot button as far as current political wisdom is concerned, gun control, racial isolation, income tax, I go down the whole checklist. And in every instance, the coalitions got together to go ahead and, and, and pass laws which other people were running away from and which needed to be done. So being an independent also has a very unique uh, plus in the sense that, well, the best way to illustrate it is the income tax. One of the reasons I think it passed was that I'm the guy that proposed it, and so therefore it will not go down in history as being the income tax of the Democrats or the income tax of the Republicans, but I'm the lightning rod that it descends on. Fair enough, that's okay, as long as, as, long as it gets done. And there's where the independent, I think, can play a very valuable role in, in, in brokering good, good legislation rather than partisan legislation. I would much prefer to see a two-party system. It is simply sounder and, I think, structurally more attuned to what we are as a people. The vacuum is there because the people who lead those two parties have ignored the vacuum and where Amer the American people are. <clears throat> I think if Colin Powell were to run, he would be your strongest independent candidate. If he were not to run, I think the person to my left, speaking physically, um, <laughs> now you know why I was in trouble with the Republican Party uh, when a Democrat says I'm to his left, I got to <laughs> would be at the top of the list of people that I think the American people would take a look at. So that's part of my reason for wanting to to um, share the uh, platform tonight, but it's like anything else. If there's a Faneuil Hall, Quincy Markets, phenomenally successful, why? It, provi it provides something people want. And a third party or an independent candidate will do well only if he or she presents that. So there's a justice to all this in the end. We get the government we deserve. And if somebody stands up and fills that vacuum, whether it's a Bill Clinton, <clears throat> whether it's a Bob Dole, whether it's a Colin Powell, whether it's a Lowell Weicker, in the end, there is justice. Because people will resonate to the candidate appropriately um, or not. The, the final point I would uh, <clears throat> make is that as someone who went out there in 1991, when George Bush was at 91%, anybody out there knew that George Bush was vulnerable. You could sense it. In the business community, there were very few people who believed that his economics made sense. There were very few people who were not offended by the deficit. And the Willie Horton ad did on the social side the same thing. So I knew there was a vacuum out there. Whether I was the one to fill it or not was another question. I sensed the same thing. I want Bill Clinton to go and balance that budget in a way that the Congressional Budget Office would say was legitimate. Or I would want a Newt Gingrich to drop the tax cut and recognize that most people in this country are pro-choice 
and move in that direction. Uh, is that going to happen? I doubt it. Thus the vacuum continues, thus forums like this have an interest because you're, you all sense there's something missing here and what is it that's going to fill that vacuum? Next question. Hi. I'd like to uh, draw your attention to a practical question looking forward to 1996. I think it's, it's quite possible or even likely that you'll see someone like Ross Perot or Colin Powell or Lowell Weicker on the ballot in 1996. And um, one of the concerns that I have is that the more folks that you have actually on the ballot, the greater chances are that either one, the person who's elected will be elected by a minority of American voters, which happened with President Clinton in 92, or that the election will be thrown into the House of Representatives because of the bizarre electoral system that we have for electing our president. I'm wondering if that's something that concerns either of you, and if so, if there's any way that um, we can get around that. Well, it is a concern, but I guess I have to come back at you and saying, how's the present system, how's the present two-party system working? And that's, that's our contention here, not, not too good. And um, I'm not worried, I'm not worried about the governing aspects. First of all, a Congress couldn't go ahead and block an independent president. The American people would have the Congress's head in two years if they tried it. Um, the, the, the minority situation, and obviously I was a minority governor, uh, uh, and also in, indeed had been a, elected as a minority United States Senator because I ran against both Dodd and Duffy. Uh, that doesn't bother me, that doesn't bother me as much, that, that part of it. I mean, just the question of the Electoral College, I will, and all of that labyrinth. Uh, Jeff Greenfield, I'll, I'll push a book. Um, yesterday, as I was flying back, I finished his new book about, which is a novel about what happens when, in, in his particular plot, a Republican presidential candidate wins the election. Five days later, is on a horse in Cheyenne. The horse bolts and he gets, breaks his leg and there's a, a blood clot that kills him the next morning. Very upbeat kind of uh, <laughs> plot. And then it goes through what happens because the VP is someone that nobody thinks should be president. And what's in, it, this is done in some humor. It's not just a, a morbid kind of situation. But by going through the various scenarios, you, and as someone who thought he knew something about how it, the structure is, I was shocked by how the system has a capacity to really wreak havoc, where electors can pretty much go off and, and do their thing with their own agendas. And uh, so I commend the, uh, Jeff Greenfield, who was the uh, writer and does the commentary on ABC, was actually my classmate um, in law school, but it is a book that, is, that reads quite well, and, you, and there's a lot of humor in it. But the end of it, when you, when you finish the book, as I did late last night, you say to yourself, hey, this could happen. And hopefully we'll raise the visibility of that issue, and it's kind of thing that the uh, forum may consider as a subject for future discussion. Well, thank you. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And please join me in thanking our guest, Paul Sanders.